I got the absolute pleasure to speak with Deb Dan. She's one member of my polyvagal trinity. She's the first clinician that took the work of Dr. Stephen Porges and basically made it accessible and usable for the rest of us. She and I go in-depth into story follow state, climbing the polyvagal ladder, and even mental health diagnoses. My name is Justin Sinceri. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and your fellow trauma nerd. Welcome to the Polyvagal Podcast. All right, so I think my audience has a pretty good understanding of the fundamentals of the polyvagal theory. Perfect. <laughs> the story follow state, though, I think is really, and that's your mm. phrasing right there, right? And I, yeah. I say yeah. it all the yeah. time, and hopefully I've given yeah. you enough credit because it's huge. Oh, that's true. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. so how, how would you, I don't feel like I adequately ex- describe the story follow state. So how, how would you do that? Right. So so for me, and in, and it's sort of that, putting things on, on, on its head, you know, polyvagal theory in, in the clinical world is a paradigm shift. So we're asking people yeah. to, to look at things differently. And one of the things is that story follows state, that your autonomic state um, comes to life and then um, it, the information's fed up to your brain and your brain's job is to make sense of what's happening in the body. So it makes up a story. And the stories that emerge from dorsal, sympathetic, and ventral are very different, right? Because, the, you know, from from dorsal, a story that um, I'm safe and this is going to be a easy interview, it, it's not supported, right? From sympathetic, you know, the story probably is, oh, my God, I'm nervous. I don't know what to say. But from ventral, <laughs> the story is, oh, Justin and I are just going to have a really nice conversation, see where it goes, so you can see how the story changes depending on my state, not depending on what I choose to think, right? So when I'm working with, with clients, I'm always, you know, they'll, they'll tell me something, some, you know, a, a bit of story. We'll say, that makes perfect sense because you are in whichever state you're in. You know, I, I have a, a, a very simple little, little um, practice that I use with my clients. It's, you know, I call it um, looking through three states. Yeah. Or listening to three states, whichever, and so, you know, it's it's sort of that that simple thing of take a very simple um, experience, something that's that's not really dysregulating, just something very simple, and then imagine that you're looking at it through the eyes of sympathetic, through the eyes of dorsal, and then through the eyes of ventral, and just see what's the story that emerges from those places. And I think clients often have a, a very powerful. Um, response to that and so it's it's sort of your way into saying so there you're feeling the power of your nervous system to create your daily experience Mm. it it is a really powerful to to see the difference and Mm -hmm. i like when with clients that they come in to session in a certain place and they have a certain story to go along with that but by the end of the session same Mm -hmm. situation same facts but the story has changed and to be able to say to see Mm -hmm. where where that and it wasn't we didn't exactly do any special techniques or anything. It was just mm-hmm. a lot of co-regulation, mm-hmm. uh, safety mm-hmm. cues. They come up right. the ladder. It's a whole different, right. yeah. Right. So yeah. the story is not just during the state shift, but it's also if you exist in a state of mm-hmm. dorsal or shutdown, mm-hmm. your story mm-hmm. is just perpetually filtered. Yeah, and then I, I like to, to, to say we, we have a sort of an autonomic profile that gets created over our over our life mm. um, Recently, I've been talking about, you know, our our preferred home hopefully is in ventral. That's what we're aiming for. We have a home in ventral. But then I've become to say we have a home away from home, right? And so what's your home away from home? You know, my nervous system was shaped so that my home away from home is dorsal, right? So that's kind of where I go, right? What's yours? I'm starting to realize more and more it's dorsal. And if you'd Mm -hmm. asked me when I started the podcast in February – I'm in a pretty uh-huh. safe and social place, and for the most part, and I think I still am. Sure. But I'm realizing yeah, yeah. I very easily go into this. I want to hide, yeah. and I do very well yeah. when I'm alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you have a home and a home away from home. You yeah, know? And, yeah, and and because I have a lot of dorsal flavor running in the background, um, if I begin to feel a bit challenged yeah. in my ventral, the, the the story that emerges is usually one that has a dorsal flavor, right? So it's sort of lurking there, waiting which I think is true for all of us. I think our, our and I think we also have a, a sort of a, a theme to our dysregulated stories. Like, you know, mine might be, um, you know, I'm not, you know, who do I think I am? I'm not, you know, worthy of yeah. being seen. Yours yeah. might be, I'm not 
you know, I'm invisible. Nobody yeah. wants to see whatever it is. But we so we have a theme to those um, to those stories, and that I think is what we see with us. We see with our clients the theme, right? Absolutely. It's mm-hmm. interesting that even just saying home away from home is mm-hmm. is that a new story mm-hmm. in and of itself? Because I hear that and I'm like, oh, that's so normalizing. Mm-hmm. Yes, for wanting yes. to be in this, not sorry, not wanting to be in shutdown, but for sort of going there for, so right, that's, easily. That's, yeah, that's where I visit. That's that's where, you know, my system was shaped. And I think if, if one of the most important recognitions that I've had from the teaching that I've done over the past couple of years is that because my system is, is shaped to um, move into dorsal and it's the, the state that people don't talk about much that I really normalize it. And then we have these great conversations in groups and and groups of people whose home away from home is dorsal get together and they talk and there's this lovely sense Mm. of, oh, it's not something to be ashamed of, right? It's just, it's just a biological place that, that I go to. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking is I know, and I'm thinking about the people who are listening, plus I'm taking it in, plus, um, but the shame part of it and the judgment part of Mm-hmm. our state mm-hmm. and of our stories and yeah saying home away from home there's mm-hmm. an acceptance of there's just a biological thing going on here but yes. i know a lot of my listeners and readers yeah. and that yeah. it, there's they haven't quite gotten there quite towards gotten, yeah. the normalcy yeah. part of it right right you know it's like when when you're working with someone or even someone in your life who's who's dysregulated if you can look across the way and say oh that's a dysregulated nervous system Mm-hmm. Right. Then that begins to help. And if you can say, oh, it's not that he doesn't want to right. be in connection with me. It's that his biology won't let him right now. Then that, again, helps to give it a different story. Right. It's, mm-hmm. it's because we are story making beings. That's what we do as humans. But I'd like the story to be based in the biology. Right. What's your autonomic story? Not what's your cognitive story. Let's start there. I like how you um and we're dancing all over my outline here, which is, <laughs> we're already hitting on things here. The dif- the sep- that is differentiated between story and your autonomic state. And mm-hmm. I, I was literally just watching an interview right before I talked to you here. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And we see, I'm trying to find it on my outline. Um, you called it, oh, neural exercises? Yep. The story versus yep. the body state. And that in therapy that you, I don't know if exclusively, but I know you work with body state and story. But there's yeah. also just the piece yeah. of just the body state, yeah, right, yeah. and mapping that. And... Yeah, yeah, I like to start there because you know, as you said, clients come in and they have this story to tell, and yeah. you know, I, I I like to. I'm a fairly active therapist when I'm working. I say, so you know, time out. Can can we stop there a minute? Because I really would like yeah. to hear this story, but I'd like first for us to arrive here and and get connected, because they're telling a story that's coming out of a survival state rather than a ventral place so it's going to do neither of us any good right so you know we start there and then I often tell my clients that that um, I think you've told that story so many times that you're really an expert at telling it but I'd like us to listen to your autonomic story because I'll bet you haven't heard that one yet you know, and then we sort of enter in there because we do want to be witnessed. Absolutely. It's part of the healing process to be witnessed. But I like to start by witnessing the, the nervous system story first. And then when we're regulated, we'll move up. And then I really do want to hear what's important for me to know. Right. Yeah. Is that have a lot to do with the process of befriending? I think it's, you say it's the first step, right? Yeah. 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 I've got to befriend. And so many of us have a hard time doing that. And befriending involves some self-compassion, right? Which also yeah. is hard to, to get to. So how does yeah, someone, if I can look at my, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. How does somebody, yeah. bef- cause I'm, you know, I'm thinking about the people I work with and people mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. listen, yeah. how do you befriend yourself when you have, when you're full of these stories and judgments and blame and shame mm-hmm. and, and then to say, yeah. well, I'll be friends with myself. How, how does that happen? Right. Well, you know, it, you know, Steve has that wonderful foundational um, belief that everything is, is an adaptive survival response, right. right? I'm a, I'm a trauma therapist. So what I say is every behavior is a, in service of survival. Everything is in service of survival, no matter how crazy it looks, <laughs> your nervous system has enacted something because it's, it's trying to keep you alive. So if we could start there, 
and just, you know, bring that in. And then what I help my clients do is really get to know their nervous system before they can befriend it. So we got to get to know mm. it. We got to map it. We got to know what does ventral sympathetic and dorsal look like for you? How does it come alive? And, you know, what does it feel like when it's here? And then those two um, statements that I have on my my map that I use um, when you're in each state to fill in the sentences, the world is and I am. Because those two sentences are the core beliefs that are at work when you are in that state, you know, and so just that's a way of getting to know. So I guess we get to know and then we can begin to befriend because then it yeah. begins to make sense that, oh, of course, of course, I think everybody's against me when I'm in sympathetic, you know, because moving into sympathetic that's the, that's the that's the feeling. You've now become my enemy, not my friend. I no longer care about social engagement because my biology simply wants to keep me alive, right? And then I tell people in dorsal. So in, if if in sympathetic you're my enemy, in dorsal you don't exist, right? Because in dorsal I, I'm just out there floating on my own somewhere. So yeah. only in ventral can we do this. Absolutely. Mm. So before we even can be friends, it's really just learning these new pieces of information, mm -hmm. which yep. just these um, facts, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Just these yep. new pieces of information. I hear that a lot is that now I understand this and it's so freeing that it, yes. it's, it kind of, yes. it takes away some enough of the judgment to be able to look a little bit more. Right. Inward. Right. Because when, when, when we begin to take away some of that, that, that judgment, that, that self-criticism, then there's room for curiosity. And curiosity is yeah. what you need in order to be front, right? In the beginning, you're simply taking in facts and we're doing this, this dance of, of giving them information and how is it landing and we're doing it. Then there's room for curiosity and we can be front. There you go. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's get a little bit more in depth mm -hmm. here with the story follow state, but also you, you brought up adaptive behaviors. Mm. How do we go from, it's really like, let's say a trauma or a mm -hmm. series to mm -hmm. story fall state to adaptive mm -hmm. behaviors where we're adapting just to, to get our needs met or to survive maybe yep yeah so so if we think about neuroception yeah um you know sort of that below conscious awareness detection of cues of safety and danger um you know once we recognize how our how our system works and then we've begun to listen to the stories then, you know, if we think about neuroception, we think there have to be more cues of safety than danger in order for me to move into ventral. Yeah. So if I can't move into ventral, then, you know, my therapist, my friend, myself, if I have enough observer on board, will say, well, what are the cues of danger in this moment? And then are there any cues of safety I can bring in? So for me, I'm always getting very concrete about what are the cues of danger? So if we're having a conversation and all of a sudden um, you it feels like something happened. I'm going to stop and go, Ooh, what was the cue of danger that came in there? Yeah. Cause I'm curious, yeah. right? And, I'm, and I truly am curious to know because with my clients, if we can map the cues of safety and danger, then we have a, you know, a guide to what needs to happen to make this safe enough to, to do this work, you know, we're for therapists um, or for people when you're connected with someone and you think, wow, they are just not really trying or they mm. really don't want to, do this if we you know reframe that through the nervous system the nervous system is neurocepting way more cues of danger than safety and it can't do whatever it is you happen to be wanting them to do right so yeah. the adaptive survival responses come out as in a response to cues of danger and oftentimes what happens is there's a cue of danger that has a, a bit of familiarity to something in the past yeah and so my nervous system is going to go into that full-blown response because it, it can't discern. So discernment is the next step, right? We, we move into discernment. And, and the way I like to do that is to simply say, in this moment, in this place, with these people, is this intensity of response necessary? So that brings it into, I get it was necessary then, but I'm not sure it is now. And I just use that basic frame with my clients, you know, in this moment, in this place with me, is it necessary? Thank you. Um, mm. How do our stories impact our ability? I'm sorry. How do our stories impact our ability to climb the polyvagal ladder? Mm. 
<laughs> yeah, because yeah, when you're down at the bottom of the ladder, stuck in that dorsal vagal yeah. story of hopelessness and despair, um, it's hard to to begin to feel some mobilizing energy to climb the ladder. I, I think in the beginning, for many people, climbing out of dorsal um, is is really difficult. I know with my clients in the beginning, it, it's more of a they need a co-regulator. They yeah. need somebody to accompany them. It's very hard to do on, on your own. Once you kind of get the hang of it, you can um, begin to reach for some of the resources that that bring a gent- You just want a very gentle return of energy because too much is going to be terrifying. You're going to go deeper into dorsal. Right? Yeah. And so you, you begin to leave dorsal. You have to travel through sympathetic which is where many people get stuck. They get to sympathetic yeah. and they go back to dorsal, sympathetic dorsal. That's a common loop. So what we need is to, is to keep moving through sympathetic. So we have to have our energy used in an organized way and often in connection with somebody else. And then we keep coming up to, up to ventral. But yeah, it's a, that, that's a skill because you know none of us are going to spend all of our time in ventral. That's even not right. the goal. The goal is to be flexible in how you navigate between states. So, you know, when clients get stuck in dorsal and then we make our way to, to ventral, I always tell them, your nervous system knows just how to do this. It, you know, we are just reminding your nervous system. It knows the way back to ventral. And we're going to keep doing it so that it, it remembers it more easily. And one of those right? things that kind of stops that natural process from happening are the stories of that we hang yeah. on. I don't want to say hang on to because it's not like we're choosing to, but the stories no, that we've adopted. Yeah, yeah because our, our, our trauma stories live in sympathetic and dorsal. So when we hit those states, our trauma stories, you know, grab us. They come alive and, and grab us. So yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. I feel like I see a yeah. lot of the people I work with climbing from shutdown, from dorsal into pretty much like a fight state first, right? Sympathetic, but usually yeah. it looks like a lot yeah. like fight. And yeah. when they get there and the energy comes up mm-hmm. that they mm-hmm. then stop climbing the ladder and sort of go in my mind, it's a parallel. They go parallel and they sort of stay there yeah. or come back down. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, it seems like the story is what kind of keeps them stuck there is the story is, well, it's this person's fault or it's this thing that right. happened or exactly. and now we're not moving yep. up anymore. It's just kind of right. st- stay right. stuck. Yeah. And that's a that's a very common sympathetic story, right? It's, it's a blame story. Yeah. Right. It's an unfair, it's a blame story. So yeah. yeah. So our job when when people come out of dorsal and begin to feel the flavor of uh, sympathetic is to first celebrate, oh great, you're mobilizing. Yeah. And then and let's keep moving up. <laughs> let's figure out how to channel this energy so we keep going up. Right. And, and again, my work is about really um, being explicit about all this, because I think that, you know, therapy is often this lovely, magical thing that happens, but it's a mystery. And I don't yeah. want this to be a mystery to my clients. I want them to become active operators of their nervous systems. So I, I love to narrate the story of what I see happening. You know, and there's a lot of celebrating. Someone begins to come out of doors. Oh, yes. Great. You know. That's yeah. not something we hear from therapists very often, that level of transparency. And just based on the interviews and book, like you're, you, you don't hold anything back as far as the language mm-hmm. or the mapping or the befriending. Mm-hmm. Like it's all out there. I'm mm-hmm. guessing the, your clients right. have and, had and, 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 and even the, you know, the talk about transparency, you know, yeah. I, I can certainly talk, you know, to a client and, and simply say, you know, you know, what, um, come on in and let's sit because my nervous system is still a bit jangled from early this morning. So let's just arrive here together. And then we arrive mm-hmm. and they don't need to know why they only need to know that. Right. And yeah. Because, and what I keep telling people is you, you think you can get away with not being regulated with your clients and you can't because their nervous system knows it. Right. It does not matter what you say. Their nervous system knows what's happening inside your system. So, you know, my belief is that we should be honest about that. We should be transparent, not about the reasons about, you know, yeah. whatever happened, but the yeah. fact that, yeah, you're probably feeling a bit of, you know, dysregulation. So I'm just going to come. And now can you feel that I'm here with you now? Because that's the other end of it. We want our clients to be able to 
accurately identify when someone they're with is dysregulated, but also accurately identify when they come back into connection. And those things are missing for many trauma survivors, right? Well, Both ends of that. I don't remember ever learning this stuff in school whatsoever. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. That reaction was great. And yeah. it's, it's sad because, well, I didn't know I was missing this until right. all the big old theory. Right. And right. the people that message me almost daily basis are saying, why aren't, why isn't my therapist talking about this? And why mm. didn't we learn this in school? And I don't know if I have a clear mm. answer for that, but it well, was missing. You know, it's, it's, it's new and it's getting out there and, you know, from, from the not, amount of. It's not new though. It's been around since 1994, right? Well, on yes. that level, right? It I mean, has, literally. It, 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 you know, it, it really took off when, when Steve, you know, started talking to trauma clinicians and, and trauma clinicians yeah. said, oh, I like this. And then, you know, um, my work taking it and making yeah. it clinically yeah. accessible has yeah. then let people, because I get people all the time telling me, oh, I love polyvagal theory, but I didn't know what to do with right. it. And I went, okay, so <laughs> here are some things to do. I, you know, it always surprises me that, that, you know, 90 other people didn't do the same thing I did because it's like, I, I see something and it's like, it made so much yeah. sense, which is what I hear from people. Oh, oh that's the missing piece. And then it's like, yeah. so what do I do with it? So I teach to my clients. So, you know, it's, it is, it's finding its way everywhere. It really is. You know, in my trainings, I have doctors and lawyers and teachers and therapists and regular people. Yeah. So they're starting to move it out there. Yeah. Yeah. The clinical applications <laughs> of the polyvagal theory, the book that had, <laughs> grief in there it had nursing you had oh, just absolutely wonderful i don't is it an article or an essay about your husband and what he yeah, went through with the yeah. stroke which was just yeah. so illustrative yeah. of a lot of things but especially the danger cues piece of it which yes. would in in a hospital setting which we typically i think we assume is a benign safe mm. place but mm -hmm. you listed yeah. boom 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 yeah. all these danger yeah. cues yeah and it was interesting because when you know when bob had his stroke i of course, he emailed Steve right away and said, any suggestions? <laughs> and his suggestion was beautiful and also incredibly hard. But but what it is our responsibility is, you know, as humans are loving partners that, you know, that it's my responsibility to send cues of safety to Bob's system so that it can do the work of rehabilitation. Yeah. That's, you know, that's what we do with our clients. It's our responsibility to be regulated and offer that regulation to our clients because otherwise they can't engage in the process of change that they want. And if we took that just for a minute to, to broaden it out right. into um, society, you know, if we move through the world from a regulated place and offer that to others, the world will change, right? It, well, it underlies, I think you said, um, you said many times, this is the, it underlies everything we do. The, the, our autonomic nervous system is the mm -hmm. framework or is that the, a good way to put it? Yeah. And this is applies for our experience. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you know, parenting co-regulation is obviously a big part of the cues of safety are a big part of that. We presented yes. to, um, some police officers and about polyvagal Absolutely. theory and about cues of safety. Um, uh, but you mm -hmm. know, doctors and nurses and those little moments of connection or yeah. glimmers, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just in the, I'm just writing a second book and I love glimmers and now yeah. we're going to figure out how to turn glimmers into glows. Oh, okay. You can't <laughs> so leave the, me with that. So, you have to go so, into more. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the glimmer is that micro moment of ventral vagal yeah. experience that, that truly is like, you know, 10, 20 seconds. That's that, that is its, its purpose is to simply 10, 20 seconds of, Oh, there's a glimmer. Yeah. Oh, there's one. Right? Yeah. And then if we can, it, on the days when we have a little more space and a little more resilience in our system, if we can notice a glimmer and hang out with it and really just invite it in, let it fill us and spend some time and, and listen to the story, then it becomes a glow. That's not easy to do, is it? It's not easy to do. And, you know, we, it, it, that's a practice, you know, in the beginning, yeah. um, glimmers, uh, you know, are, are even really hard for, for many of us to find. And again, if you don't have some mm, ventral flavor in your system, you're not going to yeah. see the glimmers because you're not set up to find them. Right. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's the, the thought that popped in my head is it's so easy to stay with the disconnection and the judgments and, the, and those those types of stories but i, I think mm. people feel those little glimmers here and there but to stay with them mm -hmm. to notice them to honor them yeah. 
is is not second nature or even first nature. If that makes sense, so, I think it is, but uh, we've lost it. Maybe. Well, it's, yeah. Well, it's covered up by your survival response. Because in a survival response, why would you want to see something yeah. beautiful and regulating? That's not going to keep you alive, right? And so, one yeah. of the things I do is I invite my clients to to decide, you know, how many glimmers do they want to see between now and next week, and we'll make an intention to look for them. Oh, you know, wow. so maybe you want to look for, you know, three glimmers in a week or one glimmer a day or whatever it is, and then let's see if you can find them. Right. So it's inviting that observation. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Mm. So we, we mm. kind of already touched upon this, but uh, it really struck me the default state. We kind of touched upon there is this home away from home. And mm. I think when mm. I, when I heard you say default state, it was an interview a while back. Mm. I kind of got sad <laughs> because, Aww, because yeah. uh, I'd like to believe that we all have the capability of moving up into ventral. Absolutely. Staying there, or at least yeah. being at the ability to go back and forth more easily. Yes. Yes. So, to yes. hearing that, hearing that we may have a default state that may, do you think maybe mm -hmm. something we're even born with, or something that's sort of shaped within us? Yeah, I think I, I think our I think our system is shaped. I, I think you know that whole nature nurture thing. I think there is yeah. research that talks about how your nervous system is impacted by your mom's nervous system, mm. right? So, you know, anxiety, depression have been researched around the, the growing fetus. So we certainly have, oh, okay. have that, but you know, it's that moment you enter the world, you know, how are you met? You know, were Absolutely. you met in loving arms? Were you met with, you know, um, someone who was afraid, you know, we think about, um, generational, you know, legacy kinds of, um, experiences. And I like to just simply look at the mm. nervous system and say, if my mom grew up in a family system that was dysregulated, then she was probably dysregulated. And if her mom grew up in a system that was dysregulated, so you can track it simply through, you know, yeah. the, was the, was the environment regulated or dysregulated? So, you know, and then, you know, we're shaped over our, over our experience that the nervous system is a system of relationship. It's shaped in relationship with others. So, and the, the beauty of that means that it can be reshaped as we go. Right? There's a lot more hope to that than mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. feeling like you're ill or broken or permanently yeah, traumatized or there's so much more right. hope to what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I think once you help your clients understand that, that they, they join you in that hope, right? I mean, our job is to bring hope. And, you know, I yeah. have an absolute belief in the nervous system's ability to reshape. And so I can, you know, absolutely tell that to my clients and then they can join me in that hope. And then in order to keep hope alive, it's our job to track the, the very small changes that happen because our clients can't, can't often see them. Yeah. And as therapists, we're not trained to, you know, look, you know, reflect every two, three sessions on, oh, what happened right. differently or what's, what's shifting. And, and we really need to because that's how the nervous system shifts in little ways. And when we yeah. notice them, it's like, Oh yeah. A lot of things to celebrate. I love celebrating. You know, it's like, Oh, lo look at that. And it's either what's happening differently or some, some clients like what didn't happen. Right. Yeah. Oh, I didn't do this thing I used to. Right. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I find yeah. myself getting genuinely just so excited when I see those little moments of climbing the ladder and mm -hmm. as I see them getting stuck or going parallel, though, I'll say, wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> did you notice right. what happened and what happened within your body and to really bring an awareness to the moment? Beautiful. And to build from there, Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. What are you noticing as far as when people climb the ladder in therapy? What are you noticing as they exit each stage or move up the ladder to the next one? What are some common things that you're noticing? You know, for for um, I, I guess we do have some common themes, and then everybody has their individual right. responses, which is why you know you do the psychoed about the common themes first, so that when you begin to um, well, when you're in dorsal, um, it's a conservation mode so that, in fact, your your body systems are turned down low, you know, and, and yeah. your thoughts are, are ones that, that don't have a lot of energy to them. You can feel, you know, untethered in the world, sort of floaty, whatever, you're, you're yeah. alone. You know, the, the thing that stands out to me as a client told me when she was doing her first map, I'm alone where no one will ever find me. Well, can't you just feel that, you know, the, the despair of that? And so when people just begin to have a, a flavor of coming out of that, it, it, you can feel it in the room. 
because all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's somebody there. They're starting to come back. And what I usually notice with my clients is that there'll there'll be a there'll be a peak, you know, like a ooh, you know, just this moment of of connection. Um, yeah. That that or or the or they'll 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 sit up just a little bit, you know. So those are sort of the signs I'm looking for. And then as they enter sympathetic, you're going to get a lot. You're going to get a lot more movement in some way, right? And which you then need to channel so that when you exit sympathetic to go to ventral, um, there's a there's a relaxation of it. So in sympathetic, you got to discharge energy in some safe way. So that when you get to ventral, there's there's this this flow. Yeah. In dorsal, you have to bring some energy in in a, in a safe way. So for me, it's a lot about seeing energy. I, I think that's an easy thing to to see in our clients is the is the energy moving. You know, yeah, in, really, in dorsal, really there's not a lot of language. In sympathetic, the language is often um, edgy, sharp, harsh, angry, and then yeah. you can feel the language change when you get to get to them too and I, I like to just go with my clients to say I'm yeah. going on this journey with you I'm right here with you you know because the nervous system <clears throat> wants that language the nervous system language is about connection right so yeah. in in dorsal you're not alone I'm right here I'm not going anywhere we're going to make the journey together in sympathetic you got to be, be a little more matching of their energy I can really feel that energy right now and let me join you in that <laughs> Right. Again, you're, you're right yeah. there. And then to ventral, it's like, oh, here we've arrived. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love um, and I've given myself, you know, I, honestly, in, in school, I like going back school was a long time ago. But yeah, <laughs> but we, you know, we were taught the the, the flat affect neutral observer mm-hmm. kind of thing. And I'm not yeah. like that. Yeah. That's not my natural. I'm That's an good. empathetic. Per- OK, <laughs> I'm That's an empathetic good. person. Because. Your flat affect is a cue of danger to your right. clients. Yeah. So right. I, I tell people when I do trains, I say, there's just a few things I'm going to ask you to, 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 some things I'll ask you to set aside. You can bring them back later. A couple of things I'm going to ask you to throw out. That's one of them. Do not do therapy with a flat affect because you're a cue of danger. You have become a threat right. to your clients. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I had a <laughs> yeah. client way long ago. This was before I knew polyvagal theory, but I naturally like to match their state. And stay anchored yes. in. I think you use the word yeah. anchor. Ventral yeah. vagal. It's just a natural way of yeah. being. And I remember him saying, I didn't know therapy could be like this. And he, ah, he was the, the person before me was very the neutral, flat affect. And they yeah. said, I didn't know therapy yeah. could, be, could be like this. And it's, it's. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. I feel connected, but I'm also the, the compassionate ventral vagal place to sort exactly. of like come back, yes. you know, with me in a way. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's perfect. That's perfect. And, and you know, if you don't come somewhere close to the energy that their system is bringing, it feels like this. And they're going to go, their nervous system is say that nervous system has no clue what's happening over here. Their brain may say something else, but the nervous system is going to send a message of misattunement. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta meet them from an anchor and ventral. Yeah. Yeah. So you really have to be able to have the anchor, but also to be empathetic mm-hmm. at the same time right. and understand and where they're coming from. And so, you know, well. for, for, yeah. So anchoring in ventral then allows me to go sit with my client in dorsal and simply be there. I don't need to do anything. I'm just there letting that system feel my system there with them so that the, they don't feel alone. You know, I was teaching the other day and, you know, we think about dorsal as the, the turtle that goes into its shell. Yeah. Right. And, and it's hiding and, and and this lovely guy, he said, well, now it makes sense because to get a turtle to come out of the shell, you don't knock on its shell <laughs> and you don't and you don't shake them. And I said, exactly. You just kind of sit there patiently. So that's what we do. And it, and but you have to really be beaming that ventral vagal energy to that system. And then in sympathetic, you you, you know, follow. I like to say in dorsal, I feel like I'm more of a, of a guide. I can, I can lead the way. I can show the way home in, in sympathetic. I'm following right along with you. Right. I'm going to give a, yeah. give a few, you know, structure, but I'm going yeah. with you. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The turtle images. That's perfect. Isn't that great? I love that. I know. It's I love that. Yeah. Um, so, and someone, so I had a question for you, but someone literally asked me this yesterday. Oh, good. Oh, um, beautiful. Is there a quick way out of these states, or is there a typical time period? And I told them I don't think so. Yeah, no. You know, part part of, part of what we're doing when we're doing um, 
polyvagal informed therapy or when we're exercising, you know, the nervous system is we're building the ventral capacity so that, which, which is resilience. Yeah. You know, the ability to return to ventral when you've been dysregulated in a survival response is resilience in action. So we're, we're hoping to reduce the time that you're dysregulated to have it be less frequent, less intense. Right. Um, but I don't think there's any real time frame. I would say that I think for the most part, that um, we move between ventral sympathetic um, all the time fairly quickly. We're made to do that. It's when we hit dorsal that it takes a lot longer to to make our way back. Mm. It does seem I've I've noticed with myself that working with someone who's in a shutdown, especially a highly dissociative state, they stay there. Mm -hmm. for, it seems like a long time. And on my end, I wouldn't say it's frustrating, but it's it's almost like, what am I doing wrong? What am I not doing? You right. know. So that that yeah. So. Maybe that's my story. Your job is well, and that might be a sympathetic. <laughs> that happens a lot for for therapists when 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 there's a, a an impasse or when there's a a client is in a, a dorsal state and they're not coming back as quickly as we'd like. Our sympathetic system can can say, "Oh, what do I do now? What's the next thing I'm supposed to try? How do I, you know?" Which then sends that message to the other nervous right, system. Right. 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 So if I can just simply be, what you know, and again, I'm going to name it. The other thing that I love is notice and name. So just name whatever it is, you know. Yeah. I, oh, I was noticing that that I had a bit of, of pull towards wanting to move you. So I just want to name that, and, and I'm just happy just sitting here with you. We can take as much time as your system needs, right? And I usually talk about the system, not you. You know, as much time, not as much uh... time as you need, but as much time as your system needs, right? So... Yeah, but it's up to us to be able to be patient, patience, patience. in that place. Patience, patience and I, <laughs> I find patience plus my compassion and genuine excitement for being in the room with someone, but also yes. moving at their mm -hmm. pace and being patient. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and yes, absolutely. Okay. And you remind me of something we were talking before that in that matching somebody. I had a client who we'd worked till really long for her to be able to to really identify clearly what state she was in and what she needed. And so she would come in sometimes and say, Deb, don't use your kind voice today. It's too much for my system. And I'd say, great, I can use this other voice instead. <laughs> Got it, right? And, and I just loved that. She knew that it would overwhelm her system too much yeah. of that kindness. So I said, I can be ventral with a different energy because ventral has a lot of flavors. And that's what yeah. we want to remember. Yeah. A lot of flavors of ventral. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you tell if someone is going, you might let's switch a little bit here. This is something I've it. really thought on and I don't know if I have a great answer, but how do you, how do you tell if someone's coming up the ladder versus going down the ladder? And I'm, I'm thinking of in particular people who are in a very depressive state. And I'm thinking of Robin Williams who was extremely mm -hmm. depressed, committed suicide, but mm -hmm. was the mm -hmm. life of the party, extremely mm -hmm. active, mm -hmm. well in his sort of aggressive humor state. How do you mm, how do you yeah. tell if someone who's just smiling away the pain versus they actually yeah. are happy? Yeah. So I'm going to give you the really simple answer for okay. my clients and for the people in my trainings is I ask them where are you on your map, right? I mean it's just okay. my job my job is to help them track, right? And so you know, so I've been overthinking I, that, this. All right. <laughs> yeah, the guiding it's kind of the guiding question all the time. Where are you right now? Yeah. Right, and we think about Robin Williams, you know, with with you know whatever mental health issues were going on there as well. You know, if he, you know, if he'd been sitting with me doing his, you know, humorous whatever, and I said, "Where are you on your map?" My guess it would be sympathetic, right? It wasn't ventral. It was not mm. a ventral. It, no. it, it was a, there was a survival piece to it. Yeah. So, you know, I when you feel that, the question becomes, "Where are you right now? Well, where are you on your map?" Right. And then, you know, five minutes later, so where are you now? You know, and they can get good at saying, oh, I've come up a little. Or I'm, you know, going down a little. Again, one of the exercises in the new book is this tracking across time. And it's like if we take a five minute period of time, you know, three times over that five minutes, you're going to stop and say, my nervous system state is. And now I am. And now I'm thinking. And then you're going to track it two minutes later because you begin to get the flavor of oh, changes all done. Right. Yeah. Which is what we want our clients to be able to do. And in order for them to do it, we have to show them the way we have to keep inviting them into that connection. So that was maybe a facetious answer, but I just ask him, where are you? <laughs> you know, 
What about so. someone who's not in therapy and they're they're really and I they you know again I hear this a lot is well what I can't tell what state I'm in, you know. Oh, so right. So if you can't, so then that's a perfect opportunity for me to say, okay, so let, let's let's figure it out, you know, because the, let's find the, the the landmarks for those three states so that we get a flavor of what happens. And and again, I usually go back to energy because it's the easiest way for people to understand. Do you feel like you have a ton of energy inside you right now and you can't sit still? Sympathetic. Do you feel like you just have not enough energy to to want to really do anything? Dorsal. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. think that people use that energy as a way to prevent from going down into dorsal? Like it is, it is the adaptation to be highly energetic. And I keep going to, there's so many yeah. comedians, Chris Farley, John Belushi, yeah. um, and yes. I, Robin Williams who yes. have yeah. a lot of, and I, we're not diagnosing here, yep. whatnot, but obviously yeah. have a lot of yeah. stuff going on, but mm-hmm. you would never, you mm-hmm. can never tell just based on the way they present. Right. 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 So, so let's think about sympathetic. So it's, it's the one in the middle, right. right? It's, it's, and so sympathetic, when you're in sympathetic, you have two, two choices, two ways you can go. You can come back to ventral or go to dorsal, right? And one of the jobs I think of sympathetic is to keep us out of dorsal because dorsal yeah. is the most life threatening for us as humans. It's the most difficult place to go. So I think sympathetic works really hard to keep you mobilized and to keep you because if yeah. it calms down, the worry is you're going to go to dorsal, not come to ventral. Right. So yeah. I mean, my hope you... is that, yeah, my, my hope is that as we calm down, we come to ventral, right. but many, many, for many clients, that's not been the experience. So they're going to stay in sympathetic because the alternative is dorsal despair. So it kind of keeps you highly mobilized as a way to prevent going completely mm-hmm. into a, a shutdown state. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's, mm-hmm. and we're looking for the calm of actual stillness, not the calm right. of so, you're still, but right. you're not present. Right, right. And so, the, and, and I think stillness is the most complicated autonomic blend of states because as we, how do you um, come into quiet, into stillness without stimulating shutdown? That's, it's a tricky thing yeah. to do, especially for people who have a, a trauma history where, because stillness is, is a very vulnerable place. Right, I have to really feel safe to come into stillness. So, that ha- that yeah. has to have a lot to do with laying down to go to sleep, and yeah. all of the yeah. anxieties mm-hmm. that come along with that. Right, because think how vulnerable that is to lie down and, you know, go to sleep. Really, yeah. you know, let go, and then you know, for many people, um, it's that's hard enough. But then try sleeping next to another nervous system. Right. And how complicated that is. So how many people don't sleep in the same bed or the same room with with the people they they share a house with or or share a share a life with? Because it is just too challenging for their nervous system. Mm. Are you noticing any um, typical or predictable sensations, feelings, temperature changes, heart rate, things that are that people are reporting in session? Um, as as they're climbing the ladder. Yeah. So so when you begin to you know you've got a you probably have a very low heart rate in, in dorsal and and right. you know not a lot of not a lot of energy and, and a fuzziness to your to your thinking and so as you start to mobilize you can feel you feel you feel your muscles coming back um, online you can feel your heart yeah. rate if you're you know if you're connected your heart your breath is going to change. And, and watching breath is often a, a, a nice cue for what's happening, right? Because um, in dorsal, you wonder, was my client breathing still, <laughs> right? right? It's like, can I see it? <laughs> and then in sympathetic, it's really right there. And then, you know, you come to ventral and it's yeah. it's better. So, yeah, you, you really see it in, in the, if you see it in the body, you see it in, in um, dorsal has a, a, a a collapse, of course, and and you can you can see the slump sort of that that's where yeah. this and sympathetic can can um, can look um, edgy or hard or it, or jerky, you know, it's got that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then there, there's this lovely sort of you know integration that happens in ventral. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. How mm. are you doing on time? Just a real quick pause here. It's 47 minutes. Are you okay on time? Or should... I'm fine. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm having fun talking polyvagal. Me too. I, I'm really <laughs> yeah. enjoying this. Um, well, there's a whole new, whole other topic that I have 
I'd love to get some thoughts on, which is diagnosis. Uh, and the... yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is the bane of our clinical existence, isn't it? You know, and and it's interesting because um, I think Dan Siegel in Interpersonal Neurobiology talked about, you know, you could use every diagnosis in the DSM as as um, a disorder of chaos or rigidity. And you know, I think Steve and I would say through the lens of polyvagal theory, almost every diagnosis in the DSM is a dysregulated nervous system, right? So, you know, I get that many of us have to diagnose to be um, reimbursed for our services. Um, I, I probably shouldn't even say this on a webinar, but, you know, it's, it. I just. I can edit it that, out if you want to say it and you, it, you think it, twice yeah, about it, I'll because, take it out. You know, put it out there that you give a client a diagnosis, it follows them forever, right? And I'm very careful about that, very careful, because I, first of all, I don't think they're they're useful in, in a lot of ways, and, and then it's something that's going to be on their record forever. So my favorite, you know, and, and I will say I don't have to diagnose anymore, which is lovely. I don't bill insurance companies, but my favorite when I did was adjustment disorder, because it is, mm. it is one of the few diagnoses that, that is a response to a stressor and goes away when that yeah. has been resolved. That feels absolutely autonomically um, in line with me, that your nervous system is dysregulated because of this thing. Absolutely. And as you can regulate your nervous system, then that diagnosis is going to go away. So, you know, but I mean, you could probably look at you know, anxiety, the anxiety ends of things is more sympathetic. The right. um, depression things is more dorsal. Yeah. So, you know, when I'm working with people who are wanting to bring this lens into their assessment and treatment, I say, well, your, your assessment is, is really, I know you have to do that assessment piece of paper, but what you're looking at is not so much what happened but what was your client's response to what happened? What was their autonomic response to what happened? And then you can begin to frame their dynamic formulation through their autonomic challenges and their autonomic um, um, things they do well, right? You don't have to talk so much about these other things. You can simply talk about, you know, a nervous system that has been shaped through experience to struggle with connection, to move into dorsal, to, you know, you can talk that way. Right. That's not what people are being taught in school, Deb Dana, not at all. No, it's not. It's I know really it's not. not. I, you know, and I will say when, when I was um, had a full-time practice and billing all the time and I would write my assessments and write my notes and write my treatment plans. And, you know, I always had this sort of in the back of my head sort of wish that somebody out there in the insurance world was reading them and would call me up and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> because then you could have the conversation, you know, never you mean, happened, but <laughs> you mean you put the language of the door, uh, polyvagal. I've started doing that as well. Cause it just, yep. So maybe someone honest. will call you and say, Justin, tell me what you're talking about. Cause I don't understand it. And then yeah. you can, I, I always think it's an opportunity to teach. Right. Luckily I work in a school system that does not diagnose and I love it yeah. because when I was doing I... it for the County, it just, it never felt mm -hmm. right. And I knew I had to, but right. a lot of times I was, I was, I was thinking, I don't how I don't, why am I labeling yeah. this? Of course, this person is in a more of a shutdown of place, or of course they're upset. Of course they're disconnected. Why am I diagnosing this? Any one of right. us could have, could have been there, but, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. that's yeah. not the way we talk yeah. about it openly. And I know we're yeah. there's a lot of destigmatization mm -hmm. of mental health, which is fantastic, mm -hmm. but this is not mm -hmm. how we talk about it. We talk about it as if people are born this way, or right. that they yeah. have a thing that's inflicting them. That's... And let's give them a med to fix it. Right. Yeah. Which seems more yeah. stigmatizing to me than anything else to tell mm -hmm. someone that you're, mm -hmm. well, people are just born this way mm -hmm. or people mm -hmm. have an illness or people have, I am mm -hmm. bipolar or I am ADHD. Right. right. That seems right. a lot more stigmatizing right. than yes. anything yes. else. Absolutely. And I love that you're working in school because you have the opportunity to educate the teachers, the parents, yeah. everybody. And so everybody can begin to talk the same language and, and look through the same lens which would be pretty magnificent wouldn't it that's my big goal is to have mm -hmm. this type of language of shutdown yeah. flight fight mm -hmm. of being safe and social mm -hmm. to have that be mm -hmm. and it's so understandable just you hear the mm -hmm. words you just get it and you don't mm -hmm. have to have a special training in it whatsoever it's just teachers mm -hmm. can get that mm -hmm. cops can get mm -hmm. that parents can mm -hmm. get that and mm -hmm. a, a first grader and can get it too he, he got it absolutely 
Absolutely. Um, I was thinking, you know, kind of brainstorm with someone about a school setting the other mm. day and the teacher who has, you know, 28, 32, however many nervous systems there are in front of them to, to regulate can't do it on their own. They can be sort of the, the safe base, but wouldn't it be cool if every kid could identify where they are and the ones yes. who are ventral, could, <laughs> the ones who are ventral could go help the ones who aren't. Yes, it would right? be. And because then the next day, the ones who aren't are, and the ones who are aren't, and they all they all help each other. I mean, that would be be my wish that because it's about co-regulation, right? That's that's what this is about. Yeah. Well, yeah. we've kind of already addressed the last question I had here, which is: Does the mental health profession? We've talked about the schooling having mm -hmm. a new language, but as mental health professionals, mm -hmm. a new language seems mm -hmm. more yeah. polyvagal yeah. form might be really helpful. I think it would be really helpful. And what I do when I, um, I know I listened to one of the interviews that you did with Steve and oh, he okay. talked about, you're a member of our polyvagal family. You know, we, we, uh, um, did, yeah, are yeah. gathering a yeah, polyvagal family. When, when Steve and I first work started working on the, the edited collection together, he would send me names and say, here's another member for our polyvagal family. And then when oh. I would go out and teach, I would tell everybody, you're now a member of our polyvagal family. And, as the family grows, you know, we have a shared language yeah. and that then, um, it becomes a shorthand, right. Which is helpful. So yeah. yes, I would love to see, you know, that polyvagal language and, and shorthand be, be out there more in the helping professions. Well, I will keep mm -hmm. working on it. Um, I do have possibly the most important question I've saved for last. I didn't send you this oh, in the outline. Uh -huh. Are you okay. ready? I'm ready. All right. So I have my polyvagal Trinity. You are one of three people. Um, Dr. Porges, Dr. Levine as well. All right. Mm -hmm. So the question is, I call it the polyvagal Trinity. It's no religious context. It's actually the DC comic book. Trinity is, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. is Wonder Woman, yeah. Batman, and Superman. I didn't well, ask Dr. Porges this, unfortunately, but I'm going to ask you, which of the three polyvagal Trinity members, Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman, which one would you... Would you like to claim you? You can claim that. Oh, that I'm member. definitely gonna be Wonder Woman. And actually, I bought a Wonder Woman <laughs> bracelet after I did went you? to see the. I did after I went to see the movie. Went went with a friend. We had the best time, and I thought, mm, "Yep, Wonder Woman. I'm gonna take some of her energies." You didn't even mm -hmm. have to think about that. No, no, that's I, she's pretty amazing. I yeah. have to say. Oh yeah. She is pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she had the, and you know, it's interesting because. There's this experience, this autonomic experience we have of, of it's called elevation, and it's when we, um, our nervous system has this mix of sympathetic and, and ventral, and it's you see someone doing a good deed, and you are then pulled to want to become a doer of good deeds yourself. And that was the experience I had watching with the Wonder Woman movie. I left there thinking, change the world, let's, what are we doing? So I'm taking Wonder Woman. Yep. All right, it's claimed. So that leaves Dr. Porges or Peter Levine with Batman and or Superman. Do you think one of those fits the other one? Batman's more the brain. Oh, they're both pretty smart. But Batman's I'm more... i fight that one out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for giving me a shot. I hope this was um, uh, a good experience for you. I know it's going to be a great experience for the people listening. Beautiful. Okay. All right, my friend. Take thank you. care. All right. Bye. Bye. So is it okay yeah. if I just call you Deb Dana? I always Deb. refer to you as Deb Dana. <laughs> I know. You know, it's so funny because I was somewhere and there was there was a little kid who I was friends with with um, with the, the parents. And I think he thinks my name is Deb Dana. Right. <laughs> like, OK, it's so funny. So I refer to you and Dr. Portis and Peter Levine constantly yeah. on the podcast. Oh, so that's is lovely. it just rolls so off the tongue. I have to say for me, being in the same breath with Steve and Peter is a lovely thing. Oh, so come thank on. you. Oh, thank absolutely. You. Absolutely. Yeah.